Welcome to the Farming Without the Bank podcast, the show with a no BS approach to money. Hosted by a farm strategy expert and authorized IBC practitioner. Join us as we get real and expose the flaws of traditional financial institutions in order to help farmers take control of their finances, create peace of mind, grow their wealth, and leave a legacy. Now, here's your host, Mary Jo Ehrman. Mary Jo, thank you so much for joining us today. If you could, could you give our listeners just a little bit of uh, your background and how you got in started in this industry? Oh, thank you very much for having me. I, oh, how I got started. Well, somebody was looking for a secretary, so I applied for the job. Okay. And then I same said... Anthony. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing, man, but I had to swallow. Um, <laughs> oh, man. I might want to be a... Yeah. I got to be on my game for this podcast here. Okay. All right. Yeah. So anyway, truly, that's what happened. Somebody was looking for an assistant and I said, I don't like life insurance. So, but if you're going to pay me more, I'll come listen. And then they started telling me what they were doing and they could not explain it to save their life. So I read a whole bunch of books, understood the concept and said, yeah, I'm not going to be the assistant. I'm going to share this with people and I'm going to tell the world about it. So you got an agent position open. Nice. Ah, that is how it all began. What sort of books did you read? So I read, um, I read Becoming Your Own Banker, Warehouse of Wealth, How Privatized Banking Really Works, Pirates of Manhattan. And then there was another one. I read five books in six weeks. I don't remember the, I don't remember it. I think it was Financial Independence. Mm. By Dwayne? By Joy. Yeah. yeah. By That's Dwayne. almost the exact list that I started with. Mm-hmm. And I didn't understand any of it until I got to... Do- Just like Cameron. He still doesn't. <laughs> Cameron, there's this other book called Wealth Without the Banker Wall Street. Maybe that one will help. I heard it was great. <laughs> so, but yeah, it really... like I, Because I did not come from the financial world, I really had a hard time understanding becoming your own banker. I understood the first half of Nelson's book. And really what got me is in Becoming Your Own Banker, Nelson talks about if we took all the money in the world, distributed it evenly, in three years, the rich would still be rich and the poor would be poor. And I grew up hearing my dad talk about that and my uncle talk about that. And so I was like, that's what my dad says. What is this? This guy knows something, right? And so I understood the thought process. I got the first half of the book, but I didn't understand the insurance part. Let's explain a little deeper. Why do you believe what Nelson said about the wealth? If you were to uh, spread it all out, that it's eventually going to come back to the wealthy. Prior to Nelson, I was a huge Robert Kiyosaki fan. I was always looking for ways to make money outside of the market because I knew that didn't make sense to me. And so... When he said that, that just made sense. That's just common sense, right? The people that understand money will always have money because they're paying attention to it. Yeah, we always talk about on this program is that we want to teach dollars and cents, not just how to make the dollars of the money, but the sense is the knowledge. And if you can have that sense and that mindset, you're going to get knocked down or whatever is going to happen, but you're always going to be able to build yourself up if you have that mindset and are willing to take action. Mm -hmm. And you have to want to learn it, right? And a lot of times we don't want to learn it because it doesn't interest us or we think it's too hard. And the traditional financial planners make it really, really difficult. And they want you to think that it's hard. So then you think that what they do, they have to be special with that. And it's not that hard. Even infinite banking isn't that hard. I mean, I have a client that said in our podcast interview, he said, this is really easy when you stop making it so hard. (laughs) Right? Right? That should be on a t-shirt. So this is, and it really is. It's super easy. Finance is easy. People make it hard and we have so much emotion attached to it, but we have to learn it because if we're not learning it, we're never going to have the wealth. 
Nelson's had so many great quotes. And one, and hopefully I get it correctly, but in essence, he's saying, we are in two businesses, or we should be, whatever we're making our living with and the banking business. And if we don't learn about it, then we're going to be using somebody else's bank. And then they're going to be the one making the money off of the banking function of our family. Yep. But we have to care. And if we don't care, well, if you don't care, you're not listening to this podcast. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Mary Jo, where are you at? You're uh, in the Midwest. Are you in North Dakota, South Dakota? I am in North Dakota. North Dakota. Awesome. I was going to ask, right, we're out here in Las Vegas, but uh, as you became an advisor, what were some of the reactions when you started introducing people to the infinite banking concept? Oh, that you're the biggest idiot on the planet and it's a scam and it's life insurance and why would I buy that? Because it's expensive, right? Those reactions haven't changed in 11 years that I've been doing this. It's the same reaction. It doesn't matter if I'm in Vegas or if I'm in North Dakota. I mean, it ultimately doesn't matter. I have clients in, I think we're in 38 states now. Okay. And so every one of those clients has that same... Either they think it's great or what's the catch? Right. You know? How have you overcome some of those objections? Education. I got an email from a new reader of the book this week. And she said, well, how do I know that you're legit? How do I know that this concept is good? How do I know that this works? I'm like, well, have you just read my book? Yep. Then don't stop there. Read Nelson's. Read Warehouse of Wealth. Read how privatized banking really works. Don't take my word for it. The biggest mistake you can make is taking my word, taking your guys' words, right? Don't take my word for it because if you do, you're not going to be a good client at the end of the day because you're not going to know why you have it. You're just going to trust me. Well, you trust the banker too. So stop giving <laughs> somebody else. Stop giving somebody else. You want the banker to run your business. Or you're, for, for me, most of it's farmers, but a business owner, it doesn't matter. You let the banker make that decision if you should buy something. You let the accountant make that decision if you need to buy something to avoid taxes. But who wrote the check? You did. So stop blaming everybody else. It's your responsibility to be your banker. That's what we're teaching. That's the title of the book. Becoming your own banker, right? So when you become the banker, you hold the responsibility of amortizing those loans, of paying those loans back, of when to take those loans, of what rate to pay that loan back at. So you're responsible. You have to educate yourself. And then you won't have to ask if this is legit. Well said. I love that. I was writing down that quote. But uh, so you, well, so I don't you, know what quote you wrote down, but thanks. <laughs> you'd mentioned a niche. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about your niche and then also in addition how some of your clients have utilized IBC? Yeah. So I early on realized that I had favorite people to work with. And those favorite people for me were farmers. And that is the group of people that I work with. Or a lot of those same people are not necessarily farmers, but they have your blue collar business plumbers, electricians, linemen, house builders, home builders, those sort of things. So early on, yes, that is who I decided that I'm going to work with. Um, I forgot, what was the second part of your question? How they've been utilizing uh, oh. the banking. What were you, you know what, uh, Mary Jo, before you had to answer the second question, I'd like to go a little, a little deeper in the first one. Because a lot of times when we're starting a business, whether it's being an agent or selling widgets or whatever that business is, at the beginning, like we're trying to create sales. We're, we're trying to get the momentum. And a lot of times we try to be all things to all people and we spread ourselves out. And because we, we want to be everybody to be a client, but you chose the exact opposite. You have a very narrow niche. Mm -hmm. So... Could you explain why you chose that niche and has that been helpful for you? So I did do exactly what you just said. Anybody that breathed and fogged up a mirror, I was like, oh yeah, let's be, you can be my client, right? This is going to be awesome. You don't have to read the book. You can just 
you can just come in and I'll tell you everything that I know. Worst thing ever. Because those clients, those early clients have no idea why they have a policy. They're not using it. Maybe they've canceled it because they just wanted me to take control of it, which we just got done talking about. But so then I had to sit down. One of my friends was doing some business coaching through the Book Yourself Solid system. Mm -hmm. And so I had to fill out this whole Book Yourself Solid. Who is your ideal client? And it basically, to summarize a massive book and all these questions, who calls you every single day and your stomach turns or you're excited to talk to? And I knew exactly who I was excited to talk to. It was farmers because I got to talk about calving and crops and rain and all the stuff I grew up with. That's the people I like because I grew up on a farm ranch operation. So I love those people. I can relate to them. It's where I like to be, right? So I was like, yep, those are the people I like. And she said, well, okay, then you need to cater to farmers. And I said, nope, I'm going to starve. That's a really bad idea Mm -hmm. because they're busy in the summertime. They're planting and harvesting and I'm not going to make any money in the summer. And I waited another year to actually focus in on farmers. And then when I did, it completely changed my business. I mean, it like I'm right now, I am booked out six weeks and it's been like that for the last year. And it's all farmers. There's a sprinkled in business owner here or there, but for the most part, it's almost all farmers and ranchers. That's great. I remember early on, I've heard, I forget his name, but uh, speaking where he said, uh, you're fine riches and niches. Uh-huh. Right? We can't be a jack of all trades, master of none. We want to be an expert in the field. We, we need to concentrate on one area. And that's what you've done. And that's showing that it's working out for you. Yeah. If I could give business advice, it's that I give that same, I just gave that business advice to my realtor yesterday. I said, figure out your niche. Is it a one mile radius? Is it a certain home value? Is it a certain type of person? I have another friend that's a realtor and we have figured out her focus is single women, right? Because she was a single mom that owned a home that had to buy her home. And ironically, the majority of her clients already are single women. And so it's a trust factor and it's who you can work with. We aren't meant to work with everybody. If there are certain clients that come to me and I'm like, you know what? We are not going to work well together. I need to refer you on so that you get the service that you want because it's not my personality. We were teasing you earlier, Anthony, but I'm going to use the example. I am... (laughs) Anthony makes fun of me because I am 100% German and I don't sugarcoat anything. And so when people come to me and if you're going to cry in my meeting, we're probably not going to work well together because I don't like, I don't know what to do with you. Like, I don't know how to console you because let's just figure out the solution and move on. Like, I don't want to dwell in the past. I don't want to hear a lot about what happens in the past because we're moving forward. We're changing stuff. So some of those people that need to have their hand held a little more, they need stuff to go a little bit slower. That's not an ideal client for me because I very much am like, okay, let's go. You read the book. We're ready to go. This is what we're going to do. And so if you need more time, okay. But if you need me to hold your hand along the way, mm -mm, not happening. I do want to clarify that before this interview, I was not crying. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) And that was Cameron. Okay. (laughs) No, you weren't crying. You were on the verge, but you you knew how the fact. We brought him back. (laughs) (laughs) Mary Jo, so how are... Can you share some stories on how some of your clients are incorporating the infinite banking concept? Oh, gosh. So they're using it for operating. So it doesn't matter. Again, it's a business, right? If your clients are business owners, it doesn't matter if it's a business or a farm. If you have to buy something, they're using it to, for fuel, feed, seed, fertilizer, anything operating related. They're using it to buy equipment. They're using it to send... I have a client that's sending kids to college. And so he has a policy just for college. You know, he has a couple policies and he's decided to separate them. You name it, they're using it. Vacation, 
Some of them are borrowing it to pay premium because commodity prices are really bad right now. Or they're in Iowa and they got hit by the big storm that went through and flattened everything in Iowa. So it's absolutely everything. I have a couple clients that are actually outside of the banking system and everything is running through the policy already, which is awesome. Because in reality, we're only about five or six years into this book. And so I haven't always focused on farmers for 11 years, right? So in five years, to be outside of the banking system is pretty awesome and using their operating through the policy. Now, how about do you use it for succession planning? Absolutely. It is a huge part of what I talk about because in the farm world, you have dad farmed, you buy it from dad, and then your kid buys it from you. And so we buy the farm with every single generation. And the bank gets paid on that same farm over and over and over. And then everybody struggles. And there's this mindset that in order to farm, you should be broke and you should struggle. And it's absolutely incorrect. But what we're not doing in succession planning is passing off discounted dollars. And so when you can buy a dollar of death benefit, income tax-free for 40, 50 cents on the dollar. And that goes to the next generation. And then they turn that into more life insurance. That's where we're creating generational wealth. And so if we have a policy, let's say that we have some kids that aren't in the business. Okay, do they get the death benefit and the business kid gets the business? Or does the business, the kid that's taken over the business, does he just get the death benefit to run the business? And so there's a fair versus equal fight, right? Fair and Mm -hmm. fair is not equal. And so what do you want to happen? If you're going to give the kid that's not in the business, if you're going to give those kids the death benefit, then you need to understand that they're getting the death benefit income tax free with no expenses. And the kid that got the business got it with expenses, operating and taxes every single year for the rest of their life. And so is that fair? Do we have a policy for each one? Does it get split each way? But what we're not doing, what I have found, Anthony, is what we're not doing in succession planning is we don't tell the next generation to take that death benefit and go back to Anthony and Cameron and buy another life insurance policy with that money to then double the death benefit on the second generation. I actually have a blog post on farmingwithoutthebank.com that's called Generational Wealth. And if you guys, you might want to have a a gander at it. And if you like it, great. If not, whatever. But I actually did this scenario and I took a policy that grandpa bought. He left 671 a death benefit. We rolled it to another policy on the next generation. And then we rolled that death benefit to the next generation. And by, we started with $671,000 a death benefit on grandpa. By the fourth generation, we're passing on $44 million and paying 18 cents for every dollar a death benefit. Wow. Where is that? When we talk about generational wealth and handing off businesses and handing off farms, where is that in the equation? Estate planners are missing out big time. I'm definitely going to take a gander at that. I haven't taken a gander at anything in a while. (laughs) So we will put that in the show notes. Mary Jo, you gave that example of a farm, but is that much different from a closely held business or a family-owned business? Nope. It doesn't matter, right? Because a farm is a business. So it absolutely doesn't matter. People think farms are so different. It's a farm. It's a business. It should be run like a business. If you're running it like a farm, it's probably not going well. But if you're running it like a business and you're making money, it doesn't matter if that's a farm or a business. You worked really, really hard to build that business, right? Like we don't just like open the doors, go start a business, open the doors, and all of a sudden we're wealthy. That doesn't happen. We work for years and years and years to build our reputation. And then when we hand it off, we don't do any planning. Well, then my question to business owners is why do you get up every day to build it? Like, why do you work so hard if you're not going to protect to hand it off? 
It doesn't make any sense to me. Why don't you just go get a job? Barry Joe, tell him it like it is. <laughs> no crying in her often. <laughs> No, not allowed. I'm going to put a sign back there. No crying allowed. No, it's going to say no ball babies. <laughs> what would you say to somebody who's on the fence of infinite banking? Why? Why are you on the fence? What are you so scared of? Right? Because what's the biggest question that you guys get asked? Is there any security? Is there anything protecting this? Is there anything protecting your 401k and your IRA? Why are you holding this to a different standard? Great point. It's very interesting how people will say, well, is this FDIC insured or what are the guarantees? Or, But then I'm like, okay, well, what are you currently doing? And what are the guarantees in that? And it's, they take a very conservative, stood the test of time asset. And then they're comparing it to the highlights of a very unsecure asset. Mm -hmm. But this is also something that I talk about this a lot on within my social media stuff. Is think about it, Anthony. Whole life insurance is 150 to 200 years old, right? How old are 401ks and IRAs? 46 years old. What's new? This isn't new. That's new. That's yet to be proven. What we're doing is 200 years old and we're questioning that. Because something that the government controls is creating enough noise for you to question it. But if you truly, it goes back to education. If you truly educate yourself, why are you on the fence? If you're still on the fence, it's because you haven't read enough or you're too scared to take that step. Okay, are you scared to give your money to a broker who then can lose it? A 401k, we can lose our money. And we're okay with that. Now, some German passion is going to kick in here, right? But we're okay with losing our money in a 401k because they have told us it's okay. Uh, no. Oh, I, you will not see me in Vegas in a casino. And I have walked through casinos. I have been to Vegas and not laid a penny down because I refuse to gamble. It is the biggest scam in the world. Yet, we're supposed to put our money in a 401k and it's okay to lose. It's just like going to Vegas and saying, oh, well, you're going to lose. The odds are, no, no, there's no odds. I worked really, really hard for that money. I want to make sure it's going to be there. I want guarantees. I want liquidity. I want control. I've asked all of my clients that I do client interviews with on my podcast. I'm like, were you worried about it right away? Were you worried that you were going to put some money into that policy in year one, not get access to all of it? They're like, no, because long term, it's a much better deal, right? If I'm scared of what's going to happen today, I'm not thinking long term, which is exactly what infinite banking is about. Long term, not short term, long term. I do want to clarify, if anybody does come to Vegas, we do want you to gamble because <laughs> that's where we have no state income tax. Okay, or in Nevada. Maybe they've done their research or they're interested in infinite banking. What would you have them look when they're looking for an agent to help them with? What are some things that you think that they should do or to look for? I think there's no sense to even start the process if you're not going to use an infinite banking certified agent. I mean, if you're not using Anthony or Cameron or myself or whoever else is certified. Why? You clearly don't care enough about your money to do it correctly, right? Because the concept is not about the policy. It is about the thought process around money and the utilization of money. And so if you want to do this, set up a meeting and talk to that person so that they can share the information with you and they can answer those questions that are causing you to be on the fence. Because if you're on the fence, it's because you don't have answers. And you're out in Google world finding all these people that say that we're wrong. But yet those people aren't using the right terminology. We've really been breaking down and studying Nelson's book. And in, um, I forget what chapter it is, creating an entity. He uses the word classification three times in that chapter. Because we are misclassifying stuff. And that's what's happening 
in the IRA world, in the universal life world, in the variable life world, is they are misclassifying whole life. And so I love it when clients do research and they come back to me with those questions so I can clarify those. So now they're no longer on the fence. So if you're on the fence because of education, you still haven't gotten the answers. Or somebody hasn't explained it to you to know the difference between one or the other. Now, I say words are important which we've done some content uh, of defining the difference between savings, investing, and speculating. Mary Jo, you'd mentioned about the importance of becoming certified. Why is that so important? Because it's the infinite baking concept. Because we're the experts, right? Because we're certified. We understand the concept. We don't just teach a knockoff of the concept. We're teaching the concept. We'll say. Everybody, everybody can say, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how much more you want me to say. Like to me, it's to me, it's pretty cut and dry. Do you want to go to the expert? Do you want to go to the heart surgeon or the general practitioner who can do some paddle work but probably can't do open heart surgery? Like it's crazy how many clients I see that have gone to another agent that. I now get to tell them the policy is wrong. Or they're like, I can't pay the premium. Well, because there's no flexibility because the agent didn't set it up correctly. They didn't use the right company for your needs. They did it, whatever, right? Like I got one the other day and he's like, well, can you look at this policy from XYZ company? And I said, well, I know they don't have a paid up additions writer. So I look at the policy and I said, where's the paid up additions writer? How come he didn't offer this to you before? Where's the flexibility in your premium? How much are you going to have to pay if you can't pay at all? Why does it end on X year? What are you going to do with money then if we can't put it in anymore? A, is he okay taking a loan? Because this particular company does not like loans on their policy. So are you always going to be able to take a loan? So all of those things come into play. That's about the policy. I said, now who is also going to help you figure out when to take a loan, when to use cash, when to start another policy, when to go to the bank if we need to go to the bank. Because he doesn't know how to think about money. So who's going to help you with that part? And that's the part that we three can help you with, right? Because we're certified. Mm -hmm. We understand how Nelson thought. We understand the big picture of what we're teaching. We're not selling life insurance. We're teaching a concept. You have to go to the teacher to learn. And I think it's important to work with somebody who is living infinite banking, Mm -hmm. right? Who is practicing, has multiple policies, is kind of living by experience so they can help you. And I kind of say like, if you want to get your taxes done, you're going to probably look for a CPA, right? And if, and uh, it's kind of like with Cameron, he only gets his haircut by somebody who's Paul Mitchell certified, (laughs) right? If you're not Paul Mitchell certified, he's not going to see you. So, but, and even what it makes it even more unique with infinite banking, like the policy, the premium is a premium, whether you go with somebody who's certified or not. Like, it's not like CPAs are so amazing that maybe I don't want to pay a premium. Or for Paul Mitchell, I'm going to pay a premium to, to have them cut my hair. With infinite banking, it's insurance policy. So there, there is no premium. So you, why wouldn't you go with somebody who is certified? Because mm-hmm. like, it look, really boils look down. Those minds. <laughs> with the I know. And Paul Mitchell really actually has very good products. So I can. <laughs> my my hair lady is a Paul Mitchell lady. So um, those <laughs> really really reason I know this. <laughs> um, but I think it boils down to there are so many people mixing IBC with all these other things, right? And. Are you really an IBC practitioner? Do you believe what Nelson believed? That is huge to me because I know then that you're going to do the right thing for that client. The policy is going to be right. The teaching and the mindset around the money is going to be correct. And also the product is going to be correct. Mm -hmm. I I was perusing um, Google World, I think as as you called it, there's somebody who's talking about banking, talking about the infinite banking concept, but using index universal life, which Nelson's very clear in the book that that's not a good product to use. 
You need to use whole life. And we've even have done a couple of webinars. I'm not a webinars, but podcasts on it. We even have some resources on our webpage on, on why we don't recommend IULs. But here's a guy who's promoting infinite banking, but they're using the wrong product. And as you can tell, that, that guy is not certified. And Nelson says in his book, it's not about a rate of return, right? That's all noise. And so when you really start, like I've read Nelson's book times, but when we really started studying Nelson's book, all the answers are in there. You just got to pay attention. There's no rate of return. There's no universal life. Words do matter. All that stuff that we just talked about is in the first half of his book. I, we have only gotten to creating an entity and it's been weeks. It takes us, his book is a page and a half maybe per chapter. And it takes us two hours to get through a chapter talking about it and breaking it down paragraph by paragraph. We have specific instructions of what to do in that book. And Nelson used life insurance for over 50 years. Why are we questioning that? He used life insurance longer than the market's been around. And we're going to question somebody that died at 88 years old that had used cash value for over 30 years without going to a bank? Really? Do you question your financial advisor and how much money he's got in the market and how well his rate of return was? Ooh, good point. Well done. It's been fire. Very chill. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Well, I mean, seriously, we're being held to a different standard. The market is a market and everybody thinks puts those guys on a pedestal. But then they hold us to a different standard that we have to justify every single thing we do. And they don't want to learn. Does the general public know anything about investing? No, they trust. But we're asking you to learn. And through that learning process, come up questions. How about you learn about the market? Because then you're going to have questions as well. And you're going to really be able to see what your financial advisor can answer. Awesome. Well said. They can go to withoutthebank.com and you can get either one of the books there. You can grab Nelson's book there. Both of my books are in audio. So I have Wealth Without the Bank or Wall Street and Farming Without the Bank. And both are in audio. So if you don't read, that's not really an excuse. But if you don't read, you can listen. Who does the audio? Um, a, some lady I hired. Oh, because I was wondering if there's me some gander or, <laughs> you know, I was kind of wondering if the accent going to be in there. I don't have an accent. Of course. So, no. But no, I actually had, it's harder. I did read my first book. I read Farming Without the Bank. I did the audio for that one. And then I've done some updates to it. So I had to have it redone. But until you read a book, it's very hard to read a book. And it's not as easy as one would think. So I hired it out. To oh, perfect. Show. Yeah. Perfect. So we, we are having this show notes, Mary Jo's uh, books, her website. She also has a really good podcast. Mm -hmm. Farming yeah. Without the Bank is the podcast. Perfect. Mary Jo, Thanks a ton for coming and we wish you the best. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thanks, Mary Jo. Go make it a fantastic day. Thanks for listening to the Farming Without the Bank podcast. We hope today's episode has inspired you to take control of your finances in new ways. Don't forget to check out our website, farmingwithoutthebank.com and engage with us on our Facebook page, Farming Without the Bank. Join us next week as we smash more financial myths and empower you to accomplish your financial goals.